Hey guys, how's it going? So I come to you with a tag today. It's been a long time since I've done a tag. I have a lot of tags that I've been tagged in, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to get around to doing all of them because my uh, motivation for doing tags has been very, very low. Um, yeah, and uh, at this point in uh, everything going on, I need to just do videos that I'm motivated to do, and um, yeah, so I may not get to all the tags that I've been tagged in. So if you've tagged me, and I don't do the tag that you tag me in, I'm sorry, but that's just where I'm at. So, but I uh, I really like this tag that, that David Murphy came up with. It's the finance book tag. So uh, I thought I would do it. I wrote up some answers today, and uh, I will uh, just jump right in. So number one is uh, diversification is the averaging out of independent risks in a large portfolio. <laughs> By the way, a lot of the prompts are a little wordy. Um... Uh, and very foreign to me. I don't really know anything about finance. I, the, my basic, uh, my only acquaintance with the area that David studies is AP economics, AP macro and microeconomics, which I took in high school. That's basically all. But anyway, uh, so, uh, number, so the, the rest of the prompt for number one is hold up a few books we wouldn't expect to find on your shelves. Um, I have a few and, um, if you've watched my channel for any length of time, I think you'll see why they're not books you would expect to be here. But the first one is World War Z by Max Brooks, and the second one is uh, The Bridges of Madison County by um, Robert James Waller. And yeah, a, a zombie apocalypse thriller novel and then a romance novel. Uh, those are not my things, <laughs> as you know. But I grabbed these on a whim at a, a, a thrift store uh, because I thought they might be fun at some point. Um, and then the third book is uh, this, uh, Addicted, in their own words, Kids Talking About Drugs as Told to Joel Engel. And this sort of reporting kind of nonfiction doesn't tend to be my kind of thing. Um, and so, yeah, this is sort of outside of my wheelhouse, definitely. But uh, I, I'm kind of, I have a, a vague interest in learning about, like, drug addiction and that sort of thing. Um... So I, I thought that this might be kind of interesting as a little beat up, but yeah. Uh, okay, number two is um, past results are not indicative of future outcomes. Tell us about a book or author you disliked or were indifferent about on first reading, but gave a second chance and ended up liking. Uh, the clearest answer for me on this one was Jane Austen. I read Pride and Prejudice in high school for, for a class, and I hated it. <laughs> and I tried to read Emma last year, and I couldn't finish it. Um, but then uh, just a few weeks ago, I read, uh, Northanger Abbey and I absolutely, absolutely loved it. Um, it just put a smile right on my face every time I read it. And it actually made me laugh out loud a couple times, which books don't generally tend to do. So, uh, I, I really loved it and it's gotten me excited about reading more Austin and also about revisiting Pride and Prejudice and Emma and hopefully seeing them in a new light. So... Yeah. Number three is the effect of earning interest on interest is known as compound interest. Name a book that has aged remarkably well or a book that gets better each time you read it. Um, there were two big ones I could have picked, and I picked uh, The Histories of Herodotus. Um, I tried to read this a few years ago, and I had some difficulties with parts of it. Parts of it are much more interesting than others. And I actually didn't end up finishing it. I got about three-fifths of the way through before kind of getting distracted by other books. And But it, it's aged really, really well. The parts of it that I liked, I really, really liked. Herodotus is, I think, is a great storyteller. And so I definitely am going to return to it and, and start back at the beginning and read it all the way through. Um, but yeah, that came to mind as one that's just aged really well because I just have really fond memories of, of reading it, even though at the time... Um, at the time, I found it a bit hard going because I found that occasionally the narration was just difficult to follow for me. Um, but yeah, I will return to it. And I have a book, I have a version of it now that's a different translation from the one I read before. So hopefully it's a bit better. Number four is a firm's current ratio is the ratio of current assets to current liabilities. So a ratio of one means current assets is equal to current liabilities. If current assets are books in your library you have read, and current liabilities are the books you have not read, is your current ratio above, below, or equal to 1? Um, so I own 604 books. 
I counted today, I own 604 books, which excludes anthologies of poetry and essays and other things, and it excludes reference books. So I do actually own more physical books than 604, but um, uh, that's the number that I own of, of books that I would ever read, like from you know beginning to end. Um, and of those, I've read 288. And so that means I've read 47.682%. So I'm pretty close to one. Uh, I, I didn't do the exact ratio, but I'm pretty close to one. And uh, later this year, I should easily be able to get to a one-to-one -one ratio. And hopefully, it should get below one by the end of the year. That's kind of uh, one of the motivations between my not wanting to buy books this year was to um, get that ratio lower. Um, yeah, so number five is familiarity bias is the tendency of investors to favor investments in companies they're familiar with. What is a book you go back to out of familiarity? I don't have books that I really go back to out of familiarity. Uh, I, I do like rereading, but I there's no book in particular that comes to mind in terms of a book that I, I, want, I pick up just to, because it's familiar. Any reread for me really feels like going home in a sense because um, cause yeah, you're returning to a book. Ideally, I mean, usually I don't really read a book if I didn't like it, unless it's a book that I didn't like and that I think I will like on a second read, like, like the Jane Austen books. Um, but generally rereading anything feels familiar and I, I like familiarity because I, I'm kind of one of those weird people who likes, you know, sameness and, uh, you know, and familiarity. Uh, but the, the, um, genre where I do do this a lot, where I do reread a lot, uh, for familiarity is poetry. And there are a lot of poems that I could list in this regard, and I, I was on the fence about whether I should come up with a comprehensive list, and I'm not even sure that this list is comprehensive, because um, there are all sorts of poems on my shelf that I have, uh, I, I will, um, when I have a poem I really like, I will fold up the bottom corner of the page of the volume that it's in, so that I can know that it's there, that it's a poem that when I read it, I liked it, and so that I can return to it. And there are dozens, maybe hundreds of poems over on my shelf that I have done that with, but ones that I that I return to fairly regularly. Um, Sunday Morning by Wallace Stevens, uh, The Kimono by James Merrill, A Hymn to God, My God in My Sickness by John Donne, uh, a Pit But Heaven Over It by Emily Dickinson, Catullus's poem number 68, one of his longer poems, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, and his other poem La Figlia Che Piange, Sa uh, Shakespeare's Sonnet 60, Nothing Twice by Vislava Zimborska, and Lady Lazarus by Sylvia Plath, which I have large chunks uh, memorized of. Um, I used to have the whole thing memorized, but not anymore. <laughs> um, so yeah, poetry is basically my answer. Uh, number six, investors are always seeking alpha, seeking a non-zero difference between a, a stock's expected return and its required return. What is an underrated book or a book that should be more well-known but isn't? Um, and I am putting for this a book that I've talked about several times already on my channel. It's a novella by Leo Tolstoy called Haji Murad. It's his last novel. It was published, I think, in 1912. And I think it's a I think it's just brilliant. Um, you know, it was my it was my fiction book of the year last year. Uh, the character, the title character, Haji Murad, is one of the most compelling heroic characters I've ever come across. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's about um, the conflict between the Russian occupiers of Chechnya in the 19th century and the Chechen natives. And Haji Murad is a warlord from among the Chechens. Um, and at the beginning of this novel, he's turned his turned sides. He's decided to help the Russians. Um, and it's about him and his relationship to the Chechens and his relationship to the, to the Russians, which are both very complicated. And it's just so, so good. I read it in one day, and I rarely do that these days. Um, yeah, highly recommend that. And I feel like the reason I talk about it is because it's, it's a book by Leo Tolstoy that I just feel like no one really talks about that much, um, except for one one uh, late great literary critic who adored it and wrote a whole chapter about it in his book called The Western Canon. Uh, I am, of course, referring to Harold Bloom, who who loved this novel. Um, uh, yeah, I just feel like Haji Murad is not one of the Tolstoy titles that like comes to people's minds uh, right off the bat, and I feel like it should because I just I think it's so good. Um, number seven is a derivative is a security the payoff of which depends solely on the prices of other marketed assets. Tell us about a book you thought was derivative. Uh, uh, it was This was a hard one. I had to go way back to a series that I read in uh, middle and high school, the Warriors series, the Warrior Cats series by Aaron Hunter. 
Um, this is a series of, of middle grade novels about uh, wild cats who live in these clans and just about the adventures of different cats. And um, the Aaron Hunter, Aaron Hunter is not one person, but Aaron Hunter writes these in sets of six books. So there will be like the first series of six books, which is still probably the best. The second series of six books, which I also really like. And then it's got, there are like 10 sets of six books now. Uh, and basically after the second series of six books, it just got, it just got to be the same stories just recycled with a different, uh, a different exterior. Um, yeah. So they just became, they became very derivative of themselves as well as probably of other things. Um, so yeah. Number eight, a share repurchase is when a company uses cash to buy back its own stock. Tell us about a book you own too many copies of. I couldn't think of a book that I own more than two copies of. Although, this did make me realize that I do, there are several books that I own two copies of. There are several different books where that's the case. So I have two copies of the Bible. I have a King James Bible, which I have for the poetic beauty. And I have uh, a New English Bible, which I which I have when I want to uh, just read the Bible for its story and not for like poetry. I will read the New English Bible, but when I want the poetic beauty, I'll go to the King James Version. Um, I have two copies of Dante's Divine Comedy. Uh, one is the Alan Mandelbaum translation, uh, and the other is the H.F. Carey translation. I have Mandelbaum's because I've heard it's the best translation and because his uh, end notes are, are really informative. I have the, I have the H.F. Carey translation because it's the translation that uh, the English Romantic poets like Keats and and, um, and others read, and I think that that sounds kind of interesting. I haven't read it yet, but I, I mean, I read the I read the Mandelbaum one twice, uh, or not twice. I've I read the Divine Comedy twice, but the first time I read it was the John Chiardi translation, and then I have the Mandelbaum, which I have read. Haven't read the Carrie yet. Um, and then the other book I have two copies of. Actually, I have two copies of two different books by James Joyce. I have two copies of Ulysses. One of them is a is a vintage paperback, a really nice uh, volume, uh, which I actually read from. And the second one is a hardcover, an old hardcover that I got from my grandpa before he died, uh, so which I mostly keep for sentimental reasons. And then I also have two copies of A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, one in a Barnes & Noble Classics edition and another one in a, this, in a really nice Easton Press edition. And then I also have two copies of uh, Marilyn Robinson's Gilead. And that's just because for years my copy was a paperback of that, and then I found a hardcover of it at a at a thrift store, and I just decided that I would I would buy the uh, hardcover, and after I reread Gilead, I would just get rid of the paperback and keep the hardcover. So for so that's a temporary situation. I'll get rid of the I'll get rid of the paperback soon. Uh, number nine, the Federal Reserve is the lender of last resort. What is a book your mom or dad bought for you? Uh, my dad. Uh, uh, for Christmas, got me a box set of the selected works of Samuel Beckett, and I didn't get it, which I should have. But anyway, it's a really, it's a really big um, box set of Samuel, the works of Samuel Beckett, and uh, yeah, it has it has most of what I love by him and and more. So yeah, number ten is tag people, but I get it if you don't, which is like the most midwestern prompt for a tag I've ever seen. Um, it's almost as though David is from Minnesota. Um, but uh, just like a proper Northeasterner, um, I'm just going to ignore that prompt and not tag anyone. So anyway, uh, I will talk to you all later, and I hope you enjoyed. Give me your thoughts if you've read any of these books. And um, thank you for making the tag, David, and for tagging me. And I'll talk to you all later. Bye, guys.